And, and now we'll turn to uh, TAC uh, for Virginia Trueheart to talk about debugging, profiling, and optimization. If you are ready at TAC. I, as Scott said, I'm Virginia Trueheart. I uh, work for the Texas Advanced Computing Center and I'm part of the uh, High Performance Computing Applications Group. And today I'm going to go over optimization, profiling, and debugging for modern multi core processors. The main goal here is to get you familiar with these concepts and to sort of expose you to the tools that are available to help you do this kind of work. Um, we won't get too far into the weeds, but hopefully this will be enough information that you have a starting off point um, if you need to do more research or ask Google some questions. This will hopefully give you the knowledge and terminology that you need to um, go deeper as you learn more about this stuff. So this is going to be broken down kind of into two sections. The first is going to be on optimization and profiling, and the second section will be on debugging. Um, optimization and profiling is generally considered the um, sort of streamlining uh, end of things. The goal is to write organized code and write clean code. Um, also to address any architecture or software needs that your code has. Um, so if you know what kind of uh, compute nodes you're on and what their uh, architecture is, then you can compile in ways that take advantage of that architecture so that you see better performance results and see different kinds of uh, performance based on the needs of your code. Um, it also helps you make good code better. Um, just because you've written the cleanest code possible doesn't necessarily mean it's going to perform in the best way on the system. So the idea is to evaluate your options and choose what's going to work best given the software you're using and the hardware you're running on. Uh, the second section, we'll talk about debugging. Um, most people have experienced debugging and no one enjoys it particularly, but it is the process of finding problems in your code um, and then solving those problems and then inevitably finding more problems in your code that also need fixing. Um, Debugging is sort of an endless cycle, and you, every change you make, you introduce the possibility of new bugs. Um, so as you work, you will uh, encounter more problems um, that need adjusting, and there are tools that can help make this a little bit easier on you. First, I'm going to talk about the basics of optimization. Um, there are three basic approaches to optimizing your code. Uh, first is to parallelize. Uh, second is to distribute your cache usage for memory. Um, and then to uh, achieve load balancing. Um, basically, you want to distribute your tasks and the workload as evenly as possible um, so that no one part of the processor is being overburdened. Um, parallelism is probably the most useful variation of this that you will get out of a uh, supercomputer because you can ask for more nodes and those nodes frequently have far more cores than are available on your laptop or your personal computer. Um, so the more that you can distribute the tasks of your code across those cores and across those nodes, um, the better your code is going to perform and take proper advantage of the hardware available to you. Cache usage has to deal, has to do with your memory and how you um, distribute where your data is being held. Uh, cache is much smaller than the full memory of the node, but it tends to be uh, faster because these are usually um, DDR memory, uh, so they're um, not drive-based, and you can get that information as fast, like you can transfer that data as fast as possible. So here's a few levels of the parallelism I'm talking about. When you log on to um, a supercomputer um, like Blue Waters or like SAP2, you usually land on a login node. And then to run your job, you will then transfer these jobs onto what we refer to as compute nodes. A compute node in this example would be node zero, node one, all the way up through node n, however many nodes that you can use on the system. Um, so there's multi-node parallelism where you uh, 
divide tasks between nodes. So I could put four tasks, one on each node, and this would take make use of four nodes. Um, within each node, uh, at least for this example in SAMP2, talking about uh, Skylake nodes, each of these nodes has two sockets. Um, if we were talking about nice landing nodes on SAMP2, those would only have one socket, but that's uh, an unusual construction. So in this case, there are two sockets, and each socket holds multiple cores. Um, in the case of uh, Skylake nodes, there are 24 cores per socket, giving the whole node 48 cores um, on which you can distribute tasks to run. Additionally, you may find that some systems allow for hyper-threading, um, which has to do with the logical core, meaning that you can run two threads of a task on each core, which potentially has the ability to sort of double your amount of space, uh, but it's whether or not hyper-threading is turned on on your machine if you can take advantage of this. Um, but at each of these levels is a place where you can divide the tasks um, of your code and potentially speed up that performance um, the more you spread it out. Memory works in a similar fashion, um, but there are fewer location, um, locations available for distributing that memory. So on each node, you will have access um, to some variation of cache and then also to the memory um, that is uh, for the whole node. And in the case of SAMP2, um, we have L1 and L2 cache and then the memory. Um, as I said before, they're smaller, but they're much faster than accessing um, the regular memory because the higher bandwidth um, means less latency than memory. Um, it also doesn't have to go quite as far. Um, and again, depending on what machine you're on, the levels of the um, the levels of cache may vary. And this particular example comes from SAMP2 Skylake nodes. Uh, using cache helps keep the cores fed with data, so you're not waiting on um, an input file or some other data read um, to come into the code that is performing. Um, it can automatically pick that up, and you're not. Uh, experiencing any delay, which again improves your performance and reduces your runtime. Um, and being able to reuse this cache is often critical for improving your performance. Because, um, because the cache is so much faster, as long as you can keep that space occupied and it can continue to press uh, data through to the core where it's running the code, um, you're going to see better performance. Um, in this particular example, um, you can transfer 100 gigabytes a second. You can transfer 100 gigabytes of data per second from the L1 cache to the core, only 60 gigabytes per second from L2, and only 10 gigabytes per second coming from memory. Um, so if you have a particularly um, memory-heavy code or something that's going to reference um, a lot of input frequently, then making use of the cache is going to help you a lot. Um, so mostly now I'm going to talk about vectorization because this is the top level of uh, optimizing your code. Um, vectorization is the process of making use of all of those nodes and all of those cores on the node um, to distribute your tasks evenly across the system. Um, each core has what we call a register. Um, and this has to do with the number of bits and how they are distributed across the core. Um, the important thing to remember is that data has to be moved from the cache or memory into the register before your operations start. Um, so you would start your code, all of your input files load, and then it starts running uh, your code on those input files. Um, for example, if you want to add two integers together, you would move uh, the first integer A from the cache to a register, and then do the same for integer E, and then add those integers um, together and move that answer into a different register. Um, then you have to move that back out to cache. 
Uh, the computer does a lot of this on its own underneath the system, but this sort of gives you an idea of the granularity on which the system is working. The reason it's going to move the result to a different register in the system is because it needs to be able to keep that variable separated from A and from E. So essentially the sum of these two uh, integers becomes its own uh, integer on its own and has to be placed into the register. Um, frequencies between the registers are limited, so they can only go so fast. Um, sometimes when you see uh, reviews of node performance, they'll say, you know, they will give you a number that is for peak performance. Um, those are usually benchmark type codes that are designed specifically to um, get the maximum performance out of each node in each core. Um, and so in real time calculations, you won't necessarily see uh, the peak uh, performance numbers, but you should be able to get close provided that the machine that you're using has been set up properly and that you have um, optimized your code as much as possible for that specific machine. So here's a little example of why vectorization matters so much. So if I compile a uh, C++ code called vector.c, um, and force it to use no vectorization whatsoever um, and produce this binary. When I run that no vec binary, um, the entire time to run is almost 46 seconds. Um, the calculation um, of adding uh, matrices that's happening in this particular code gives me um, the correct sum, but it takes me 46 seconds to produce it. Uh, and this was done on a SAMP2 Skylake node. In the second example, I compiled the same C++, C++ code, but instead of ignoring all vectorization options, I set XCore ABX512, which matches the um, performance settings for Skylake nodes. And then I also set QOP ZMM usage to high. This forces the uh, node to use all registers that are available on the system. Uh, frequently, the um, when you uh, compile code like this, it will frequently um, go just up to YMM registers. And if you want to use more than that, you have to specify. Um, so in this case, I'm going to force it to use the maximum for the node and also um, all of the registers available. Now, when I run this particular binary, uh, it takes less than two seconds to get the same answer as the first run. Um, so that's a huge difference in performance just by setting a couple of flags that accommodate the architecture on which the code is running. Um, and this particular code is not complex. It's just doing uh, some simple multiplication and addition. And you can see the vast difference in performance, um, even on something that simple. The more complicated and the larger your code is, the better your performance increase that you're going to see. Ways to increase your performance outside of um, basic optimization will frequently involve profiling your code. So once you've set flags that accommodate uh, as much of the um, architecture and as much of the software as you can accommodate, then you will need to start profiling your code in order to find places where you can either reduce duplicate operations or find a better uh, approach to running some of the mathematics or whatever section you're calculating. And generally that looks like this. It is an iterative process. You'll have to repeat it multiple times, um, probably before you get to the absolute peak uh, variation of your code. Um, but you would use a tool to profile your code, um, help you identify hotspots that might be dragging your code down. You can then uh, modify the code that exists in these hotspots er hotspot areas, and then decide whether or not those changes produced enough of a performance gain. 
If it didn't, you go back uh, and check your hotspots again and see if this is solved. It. And even after you think you've caught all of the hotspot uh, places, you can always go back up and uh, reprofile your code to see if those changes have generated new hotspots now that you fix larger problems. Um, and there are different levels in which you can run this optimization process. You can run it for the compiler options, you can run it for performance libraries, and you can run it for code optimizations. Um, so the compiler options are what we looked at on the previous page with the flags for um, specific node types. Uh, performance libraries, you can add in uh, to your code so that um, you know that you have a library that doesn't have to search um, as much for uh, any particular um, function. So one example of this is Intel's MKL library. Um, this gives you access to many mathematical libraries that Intel has already processed uh, on the system to be as uh, optimized as possible for those uh, for anyone running on the machine. Um, so using uh, the say the last pack that's in Intel's MKL will perform far better than loading and installing your own glass pack library. And then the last step would be code optimizations, which is changing the actual code input um, on your uh, original files for the code development. The important thing to keep track of when you are profiling your code uh, is to make sure you are controlling all of your measurements. Don't let the operating system decide um, process and memory infinity. So you, if you have the ability to pin a task to a certain core or dictate which cache um, that the system is using to retrieve information, it's important to uh, control those uh, options because then you know that you're receiving the best um, variations for your code. Um, you should also remember that no single measurement is reliable, and it's always a good idea to repeat any tests you're doing or any profiling you're doing to make sure that the um, you're getting at least very similar or fully consistent answers every time you run. Um, if you run it two or three times and the results you're seeing are staggeringly different, then we probably need to switch over to debugging rather than profiling and then try profiling again later. Uh, it's also handy if you automate some of your uh, profiling steps. Um, it's always a good idea to uh, document what you're doing. Uh, I know we all get lazy about uh, putting comments in our code and keeping track of what we've been doing. Um, but it can be very useful, and the same applies for any of your profiling processes. Um, write down all the steps you took and why you were taking them, and then you can also uh, write scripts to uh, reproduce that process. So if you want to optimize something where you change the memory cache, uh, like and you want to like make the same alteration again on a different variation of the code, you know that you can exactly duplicate that because you've written a script and it matches what's on the system. And the script will perform exactly the same way every time. Um, this is also useful for things like reproducible science. So being able to exactly recreate the runs you have been doing and the process for how you developed your code um, will be very useful, especially if you need to, um, it, you know, provide certain explanations for papers and also like, you know, submitting code um, for reproducible science databases um, to sort of show your work. Um, so this is a list of the things that's probably worth your while to save and keep track of. Um, code versions, compilers, uh, all of your input files, whatever, your timers and counters are showing you. Um, code versions are particularly useful. It can also be helpful to document what um, 
what software you're running, so what the OS is, what version of Intel you're using, or GCC, uh, if you have any special libraries loaded. These are other things you would probably want to keep track of you, tr that you would probably want to keep track because it will help you um, not only reproduce the code, but also reproduce your profiling process um, for new code um, later. At the very top level, there's some basic profiling tools that should be available on all of the machines that you have access to. Um, one is the command line timer. Uh, one is using a code timer, which will be uh, dependent on the language that you are using to code in. Um, and then a system tool called GProc. So the command line timer uh, is just the use of time. Uh, and this is the time that exists in, your, in the user bin folder. Um, in order to retrieve the actual timing information, this is the variation you want to use. You, if you just use uh, time on the command line and not user bin time, uh, you won't receive as much information uh, that is useful to you in profiling your code. It's a really straightforward tool. The only thing it's doing is tracking the time um, of each um, process in your run, and it'll also give you the total time um, for all of the runs. And generally, these outputs come in uh, seconds. So in this example, you run user bin time, uh, set the POSIX format flag, and then run your executable. Uh, the elapsed wall clock time is listed as real, so that's the entire time the code runs from the start to the finish. Um, and then the time spent in user mode and kernel mode. Um, so this is sort of the split between how much time um, the system spends on your particular code, so any of the input files or any of the executable, like, the sections of the executable you have to do, and then kernel mode, which is any of the uh, information necessary for the system itself having to process. So, um, like how much time it would take to do those register calculations, for example. Um, if you don't use the POSIX format flag, you do get some extra information. Uh, in addition to the timings, it will also provide you with the percentage of the CPU being used. Um, so you know how many cores on the node you're using. Um, and then whether there is any um, input, output, shared or unshared processes, um, and page faults, which is a bit of a, um, it has to do with memory uh, allocations, whether you're running on large pages or not. Um, so when you get into more complicated code, then this can be a nice way to just sort of spot check how much of the, um, how much CPU you're using and how much um, your code is doing just at a glance. Um, you can also use a code based timer. And each of these varies based on the uh, kind of code that you're using. Uh, for C, you have to include the time header file um, and then use the appropriate um, commands associated with that um, function. And then you also um, can set the variable of time equal to when the code stopped minus when the code started, since it um, checks uh, clock time. So that'll help give you like the overall runtime. Uh, Fortran, on the other hand, has already has built in with the concept of um, a real function um, for calculating. And then uh, when you're using MPI, it's similar. You just also need to include the MPI header um, because MPI, um, because the message passing interface distributes your tasks uh, further across the system, frequently you need to calculate the time from multiple locations. Um, and so using the MPI header in uh, C code is important if that's the kind of code that you're running. Uh, finally, there's also time for uh, Python. Um, 
which again, it still works very similarly. Um, and some of these get more complex and almost every uh, coding language has its own variation of a timer. And so just looking up the uh, timer that's appropriate for your code and then looking into the uh, functions that it has available to it so that you know what commands you want to use. Now we'll get into something, uh, a tool that's a little more complex than just a timer, so you can see more of what your uh, code is doing in an attempt to profile um, and improve your uh, performance. Uh, so GProf stands for the GNU Project uh, Profiler, and it is capable of producing three kinds of output. It can provide you with a flat profile, a call graph, and an annotated source. Um, the animated source is sort of the most uh, basic and straightforward. It uh, indicates the number of times a line was executed, and it does this by showing a printout of your code and providing a number per line, uh, indicating the number of times this was executed. Uh, this can be useful if you find that um, a subsection is being repeated more often than you think it actually needs to be, um, which can waste time in your code, or if um, it's not being repeated enough. Um, say if you develop a loop that's supposed to be doing a lot of the work, but it's only um, running a couple times and it looks like maybe something's not pointing back to where it's supposed to be, this can be helpful. Um, the more complex outputs are the flat profile, uh, which can show you how much uh, time the CPU spends on each function, um, the number of times the function is called, and it will definitely help you identify the most expensive routines, so where your code is spending the most time while trying to uh, complete the work. The call graph will also tell you um, the number of times a function is called, but it will also tell you the number of times um, a function is called by other functions uh, underneath it. Uh, so this can help you figure out where uh, your functions are relating to each other. Um, and how many times one function in your uh, code has to uh, reorient itself to reference a different section of the code. Um, this helps you see where there's functions that could potentially be eliminated. In order to profile with GProf, you need to use uh, the G flag and the PG flag. Uh, in this case, if I compile using GCC, uh, GCC dash G dash PG dash O to create an out file called exe file, um, and then the executable of the source file that's in C. Um, just because this particular uh, system is developed by uh, uh, GNU does not mean that you have to use um, GCC in order to run with it. You can also um, use GProf on Intel compiled uh, code. Um, as you can see, it also doesn't apply to like specific codes. This can be used with C, it can be used with Fortran. Whichever code you happen to use, GProf will um, still be able to process that. And so running the executable this way um, will produce an output file full of the profiling information, and then you will want to execute GProf, uh, or use GProf to execute um, that output file. So um, as you can see in the first line, it's the execution is GProf, and then the output executable and the gmon.out file that was generated by running with the G and PG flags. Um, if you want additional information, you may need to give gprof flags as well. Um, like running gprof with dash L will enable line by line profiling, um, and using dash A will be how you get that annotated uh, source file. And you want to direct these to different locations so then you can read them, um, or you can just run them on the command line and have it output there. The flat profile will look like this. Uh, in the pro flat profile, we can identify the most expensive parts of the code. Um, the particular code we're working at, looking at here um, is just a simple um, mathematics uh, code uh, for determining square roots and uh, uh, 
other like some options. So you'll see the time uh, spent uh, cumulatively in percentages, um, self seconds and calls. So self seconds is the amount of time that each function spends. Uh, and then the calls is the number of times that function is run. Um, so you can then again see um, what subsections of your code take the most effort and the most time. Um, in this case, it's fairly obvious that mat square root is the thing that is consuming the most um, processing in this particular code base. Uh, for the exact same code, if we display uh, the call graph for GPROF, you'll get an output that looks like this. Um, and this table shows uh, the call tree for the program. So you can see the amount of time that was spent in each function and then how much time was spent uh, by the child of each function. So in the top section, the first function is main. Um, and main calls on... Um, these various square root and cube functions underneath it. Um, so the total amount of time spent my main uh, was all of it because all of these functions are children of the main function. Um, and you can also see like at the bottom where cis square root gets called and then calls on mass square root and vec square root um, to do further calculations. So the organization of this particular output tells you um, what functions are used the most and what functions are touched by other functions most frequently. Finally, the dash L and dash A options that give you line by line profiling or annotated uh, source code uh, will give you outputs that look something like this. Uh, for line by line, uh, you can see like each um, it will indicate the line number, which it is um, referencing here, uh, and then tell you the seconds um, for that line and what function it was or if there's other um, aspects going on on that line. Annotated code is, um, I said before, just an annotated listing. So here it will point to um, the start of each function and then give you a number for how many times that function was executed. Um, it will then give you a summary at the bottom of the file that will tell you um, what lines were used the most and if there was any um, variation for the execution summary. So uh, the number of executables in the, in the file, um, how many of those were executed, um, and the average executions per line. So GPROF does quite a few things for you, but it is actually still a very top level uh, profiler. Um, you can move up to larger profilers if you have a more complex code or if you want to do things like generate graphs to um, sort of demonstrate hotspots, uh, especially if you're submitting code for review or if you're collaborating with other um, other groups or other people in your department um, to sort of show how these things work. Um, three, which are freely available, are IPM, which is the Integrated Performance Monitoring Tool, uh, HPC Toolkit, and Tau. Uh, HPC Toolkit and Tau are capable of generating graphs that can help you um, more quickly identify hotspots and also are good for presentation. Um, and if you're on a system that uses uh, an Intel compiler or Intel nodes, um, you may also have access to Vtune. Vtune is um, one of the more powerful profilers available, but it is um, sometimes cost prohibitive. Uh, certain systems already have access to it depending on your center. Um, if you run at TAC, we do provide Vtune access. Um, the upside of VTune is that even if you um, don't have VTune on your own computer, you can still run um, the VTune viewer, which is free to download. So if you run VTune against your code on a machine um, and you want to read that VTune output later, you can just download it to your own machine and view it later with the uh, VTune viewer. 
Um, and V2 will produce elaborate graphs and elaborate visualizations um, and also actively make suggestions of where places in your code might need to be improved. <laughs> so for uh, once you have um, sort of optimized your code as best you think you can for the time being, um, sometimes you'll have to go back and debug things. Debugging will occur throughout your process. Um, as I mentioned before, you're pretty much never done with it. Every change you make has the opportunity to introduce new bugs into the code. So you'll spend a lot of time sort of re-referencing uh, code that you've been processing. Um, in this case, uh, the basic concepts of debugging are to show your backtraces, to set breakpoints, um, track your variables or set new ones, and then also to uh, run your code in sections so that you know um, what parts uh, might be causing you problems. Uh, Backtraces are interesting because they can show you the entire history of the code up to the point that you've run it. Um, this allows you to see um, sort of the path your code has taken as it um, develops. And setting breakpoints is also a good way to do this because you can choose when to stop um, your code and then do a spot check of your backtrace to see how the code is performing and whether or not it's in a position that you want it to be. Um, Displaying variables and changing variables intentionally is also helpful to let you know if your code is uh, performing all of its calculations correctly at any given point uh, in the um, process. So just because your code is giving you something that is similar to the right answer doesn't necessarily mean it has the right answer the whole way through. Um, and you might need to check um, and make sure it's not losing track of um, numbers somewhere further up that would actually end up giving you a more correct answer as the end result. Um, and the same goes for running individual steps of your program. If you've, uh, if each step can sort of run independently or only dependent on a single uh, other step, then frequently it becomes easier to identify where the code is falling down uh, because you will find the step that breaks on start. Uh, much like GPROF, uh, GDB is available on most systems and is called, uh, this is um, also from GNU, the GNU debugger. Um, as with GPROF, you still compile with the dash G option. Um, this is basically the easiest way for the system to collect as much information about the job as possible. And once you collect uh, all of that uh, information, it's the same as this GPROF. You need to initiate a GDB session. Um, so you can run GDB um, straightforward as an interactive session. Uh, you can also start an interactive session uh, with the uh, executable itself. Um, or you can specify examining the core file uh, of the job. So that would be the whatever trap state um, was collected in the job like as you were um, analyzing it. So failure points and where the code locked up. Uh, if you are actively running a executable, you can in fact still attach a GDB to it and view the code provided you compiled it with the dash G flag. And you do this by running GDB and specifying the executable um, and then also the uh, PID of the job that's running. So knowing that process number uh, is important if you want to attach GDB to something um, that's already running. Yeah. I'll uh, give you a little break and give you a question. Actually, it goes back on GPROP okay. on slide 17. There was the ampersands under where it says that it has a main function. So that's where the after sense to the left hand side of in main void to the right hand side. And then yeah. 
under 100, apply 100. Oh, here? This is just comments to like express uh, what it is. Uh, yeah, so this is, um, because this example, um, this is either a um, unexecuted, uh, since this was uh, void, um, and actually Albert generated this example, and it may just be that the number didn't get carried through, but okay. um, it uh, could also just be that because this is a void function, it's not producing anything. Um, so I think this is just some, like, I'm fairly certain it's just because Albert's example didn't have numbers for that one, but it would indicate there. Oh, I see. Okay. So. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, there was a question that people were talking about it for, can you use GFROP for parallel FBI programs as well? Yes. Um, but they were, they were answering that you just need a lot of output. Yeah, it was training. because, yeah, because it's tracking every task, if you do it with a parallel program or with an MPI program, you're going to get feedback for every single one of those tasks, um, which is why a more advanced tool uh, like HPC Toolkit or Tau might be better for profiling if you're using uh, MPI or if you have a high, like highly parallelized uh, code because that it's more capable of handling um, that many out, like that much output, but also it has uh, functions built into it to sort of group particular MPI tasks. Um, so HPC Toolkit or Tau might be a better option in those instances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I asked about VTune to get a lot of memory. Yes. The profiling is there easy ways to get the full profile and reduce the amount of memory data taken. Um, so VTune has a knob that you can uh, alter on it to decide how frequently you want to sample the data uh, for output. Because, yeah, you're absolutely correct. VTune consumes a lot of memory and a lot of space. And if you are uh, taking a sample every half a second, you're probably going to run out of memory and your job will crash before you get enough output. Um, so if you... VTune, it's a good idea to sort of uh, spread out your um, sampling initially fairly far, um, maybe say once every 30 seconds to a minute, um, and see if uh, that can help you narrow down the point in which your code is starting to fail or to have other... Um, you know, other variations that you don't want. And then for that subsection of the code, you can increase the sampling uh, for that subsection and decrease the sampling for the rest of the run. Um, and that sort of helps you control the memory. Um, but that's, that is a specific knob on VTune that you can alter as you run. And I guess this went with this one. Um, are there any overhead, say, in terms of execution time for any of the profiling methods? Uh, GProf has pretty much no overhead because it's just collecting uh, the information that the uh, node itself, is, like the system itself is producing. Um, so all of that was already going on underneath. So GProf is pretty much free um, in processing. The more complicated your profiler gets, the more uh, overhead you're likely to have. You might see the performance slow down some, or in the case of VTune, you might run out of memory. Um, IPM is fairly lightweight. Uh, you'll see some slowdown, but it's not too terribly bad. Once you get into HPC Toolkit, Tau, and VTune, the impact starts to be larger. So it's usually a good idea to run these um, for optimization purposes, to run these on smaller versions of your code first, um, and then also break your code down into sections um, if you think um, there's a specific subset where you uh, think you could get more performance out of it. Um, it's a good idea to then break that section out and apply the profiler to it then, uh, instead of applying it to the entirety of your job, especially if it's very large. Mm -hmm. There's a few other questions about just other profilers. I know so many of them probably like you were asking about PERT and then yep. Valgrind and Cash Cashgrind. Um Valgrind Valgrind is useful for memory debugging. Um I'll mention that a little bit later as we go, but uh Perf, you're right, Perf is another profiler. Mm -hmm. Um there's not an infinite number of profilers available, but you, if you ask Google, um there will be um many available and you just sort of want to check 
um, what's available on each system. And a lot of system user guides will have either a way for you to look up what uh, software is on the system or possibly provide you with a list of what um, debuggers and profilers are on the system. So it's a good way to um, check and see what's there uh, because if at all possible, it's better to avoid having to install any of this yourself. Um, but in most cases, there will be at least one uh, higher performance uh, profiler available on the system. Uh, another one I think is Poppy, uh, PAPI. Uh, so again, it's not an infinite variety, but it, there's enough variety that you may have to um, ask your particular system uh, or center uh, which ones are available and which ones they recommend, uh, depending on what code you're running. And you can, like, as questions come in, you can ask. It's fine. Though you can break that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now it's fine. Um, Wait a okay. quick question. So, yeah, back to debugging. Um, if you're, um, so debugging is fixing the parts that are, you know, sort of actually broken in your code, whereas the optimization and profiling was sort of taking something that works but making it work better and more efficiently. Um, for debugging, we're trying to find exactly what's broken and where. Um, and so again, these are some of the ways you can execute uh, GDB to start a session and review um, the output. So this is a very tiny piece of um, uh, example C code um, that runs two functions, um, one that just prints out a statement and one that prints a statement and also changes the value of an integer. Uh, it doesn't print out the integer, but it, you know, that change is happening underneath, which will let us look at some other things. Um, because uh, GDB is available on most systems, you should be able to create a simple sample code like this on any machine um, that you run on, and then. Uh, refer to these examples again later for uh, review um, and for testing out uh, various um, commands for GDB. Uh, so this is a very small subsection of commands that are available to GDB. Uh, run, which will start the program. Um, so GDB works interactively where you start the GDB session um, and then you can use run to start running the executable. And then GDB will then proceed to output um, either the completed finished code or other information if you put other um, commands in place. So print will um, print variable located in the current scope of what's running in GDB. Uh, next, we'll move to the next command. So if you uh, pause somewhere in the code, or if you set a breakpoint somewhere in the code, next we'll then start the code, start the code back up and run the next subsection. Uh, break is the way to manually set a breakpoint. Uh, continue works much like next, um, where it will go um, to subsequent breakpoint or until the code terminates. Uh, delete is how you remove breakpoints. Condition is an option that makes, uh, you can generate a breakpoint based on a given condition. Uh, so this is handy if you're looking for something, um, if you want to see a breakpoint only when a certain integer uh, reaches a certain threshold or um, some other sort of information changes in your code, uh, it's a good way to um, put some nuance in your breakpoint so that you know exactly what you're looking at. And you can also run commands like where, uh, which can show you where the function is sitting in your code uh, via the stack trace. So it can give you sort of the line ID and like what it, uh, like the line number and what it looks like in that position. So if we use some of these um, on just a, that simple hello.c code um, that we compile, so this code, um, as I stated before, you would need to compile with the dash G flag. Um, and so if you compile this with dash G and create an output called hello, um, then you can execute GDB on it this way. 
So GDB dot slash hello, GDB starts up, reads the symbols um, from hello, and now it's ready. Uh, it gives you the GDB prompt line because it's inter it's taken in all of the information from your executable, and now it's waiting for your commands. So to run it, you just type run, uh, and then it starts running the program uh, that it interpreted, and then it prints out inside main and inside foo which if we look back at this, is exactly what this does. The initial function prints out inside main, and the section function prints out inside main, or inside foo, and uh, alters an integer, but does not print that integer. So this is what running it looks like through GDB. If you don't put any changes in, you don't generate breakpoints. Um, the code is successful, it prints out what you expect it to print out, um, and GDB has done everything that you asked it to at this point. But if we want to develop breakpoints and find more interesting uh, information about the particular code, then you can set a break at a function. So in this case, GDB knows that main is a function. So if I say break main, then it will set a breakpoint um, as a specific location uh, in the code, uh, in this case, in file hello.c on line six. And now if I run it, it will show the breakpoint and then show me what is on line six. So it's saying I've reached the breakpoint, here is what is sitting at the breakpoint, uh, and now I'm going to wait for any subsequent commands. This can also, um, as I said before, you can make conditional breakpoints. Um, you can find, um, like, if you um, reach a breakpoint and you want to see something else interesting, um, you can do where searches, um, ways to find specific lines where the code is breaking down. Um, so again, this is a very simple example, um, but the idea is just to sort of get you started um, thinking about the options, because you can, um, Find a wide supply of GDB commands online, and the um, I have links at the end to um, the GDB user guide and all of the content there, as well as um, some little uh, sites with demo examples. Um, you could also include besides regular breaks in your code, um, such as you know missing missing a parenthesis or uh, maybe you miss set an integer or something like that. You can also find um, other common kinds of bugs, especially when you are um, working with higher level applications or if you're running in PI um, and the code gets more complicated. Uh, the first being floating point errors, uh, which usually result in a NAN output or not a number output. Different codes have different ways of stating this. Uh, but essentially, you have done something to generate something that is not a number. Uh, you've divided by zero. You have calculated an imaginary number. Um, things that the system can't process because it doesn't, um, it's not possible in terms of like real mathematics. So dividing by zero is, you know, won't spit out the um, top half of the equation. It will just, uh, spit out an NAN error because it doesn't know what that number is. It's a good idea to test the test for these periodically to pre preemptively trap a diverged solution. Um, depending on what precision you're calculating at, floating point errors uh, can occur more commonly, and it's a really good idea to just um, check your math at at various steps um, as your code is running um, because it's much easier to find. Um, the basic math floating point error than it is to find some other kinds of bugs. Um, and if you can prevent the um, not a number generation, then you will um, reduce uh, a lot of headaches later because anytime a non-number gets um, integrated into your code, it causes every subsequent uh, calculation to crash. You can also run into memory errors. Uh, this is somewhat related to using the cache versus using memory um, and how much uh, space you have available. Um, the 
Uh, these are particularly difficult to trap because it's not always um, it's not always obvious and it's not always the easiest thing to retrieve from the system uh, what the memory capacity is um, or to know how much memory your job is using. Um, most user guides for your sites will tell you how much memory is available per node, um, but you may have trouble telling um, what point in your code um, something like this starts to break down. Um, there's tools that can make this easier, though. Um, the first two are libraries. One is glibc, and the other is dmalloc. Um, these are libraries that are designed to help uh, help monitor your memory usage and then provide um, that feedback. So it reads the um, reads the cache and reads the memory and can provide you with specific terms that you can then use a profiler or a debugger to call on to get that information back to the system. Um, there are also two tools available, uh, one called Electric Fence and one called Val grind. Uh, there may be some others, but Electric Fence um, uh, functions just as the name says. Um, it sits on top of your code and it waits for it to hit a certain memory threshold. And when your code hits that threshold, it stops the code and shuts everything down. So this can be useful for finding uh, sort of how high up your uh, memory consumption is without crashing the node. Um, so say the node has uh, 98 gigs of memory available and you set your electric fence for uh, 90, then you can stop the code before it crashes the node and also see how long it took for your code to reach 90 gigabytes of memory. Um, which is another way to sort of drill, but drill down and debug um, to see when that memory trip happened um, and whether or not it was how early it was in your code. Um, if you get a memory error really early on, then it's possible that you're taking in too much input or not processing it properly. Um, memory errors at the end are usually indicative of uh, output accumulating on the system. Um, that's taking up too much room on the node. Um, the other drawback with, or the drawback with memory error checking is that these frequently slow down your performance on the code. Um, as I mentioned earlier about VTune um, slowing down your performance, a lot of the memory checking will do the same just because it does take a certain amount of overhead um, in order to process all of the checkpoints that are available in these. Um, you can, however, make adjustments, uh, turn some various knobs as to how frequently you want it to check. But regardless, if you're doing any memory checking, it's best to do it on uh, non-production runs. So specific runs for testing and for optimization, uh, it's better to run them there and just strip any of the profiling and memory monitoring out of the code before running it um, at full production for uh, getting your results for papers or performance output or whatever you're working on. <coughs> Quick question. Mm -hmm. um, I'll think for I know if you're a C++ programmer, but someone asked about, is it possible to get a man to use black precision in C++? Um, so... <sighs> I'm unsure if it's possible specifically for C++, but it is possible based on um, part of it is dependent on the kind of node that you're sitting on. So a lot of GPUs are single precision calculations. So if you're running something like this on a GPU, then yeah, you're probably not going to encounter it on a number situation. Um, but with C++, it's you're always able to generate a non a number if you do something like divide by zero, but the precision does have some uh, somewhat of an impact. But I, I would need to go get someone who's better at C++ than me to give you a more complicated explanation than that. Um, but some of it relies on the node itself, and some of it relies on the math that your code is doing, and how much you know, how much precision you're aiming for. And does GDB work with OpenMP? 
same thing again. Yeah, yeah. many threads. Ex kind of, yeah. Because yeah, GD, yeah, as as with the profilers, GDB will work with um, MPI or parallelized code, but again, the output may be a little overwhelming and harder to interpret. Um, there are advanced debuggers which will help you um, sort of cycle through some of that. Uh, we have one. This is one that's free to use called GDD, which is a data display bugger debugger. Um, it's um, you have a little more control on what kind of output it's giving you and how much uh, information you want it to collect and how often. Um, you can specify items in the argument field to say, okay, I want to look for these specific uh, functions or the specific section of the code. Um, and you can see at the bottom, it's still using GDB, um, but it's put this interpreter on top of it that sort of makes it easier to search for particular items and alter certain aspects of code. Um, but it is still relying on GDB. It's just more user friendly. Um, another variation of something like this would be um, we developed a uh, tool called Remora. Uh, it's available via uh, GitHub and you can download it and run it on any machine. Um, but it also takes this sort of uh, debugging output and then develops uh, static graphs and static outputs of things like memory usage and I.O. performance um, that you can refer to later. Um, so it's not the interactive version that DDD is, but it will still give you a more readable output than, say, if you ran GDB standalone on an MPI code. Um, if you want to get very fancy, um, ARM has a debugger called DDT. Uh, TAC provides DDT. Um, some other systems may as well, but the uh, again, the drawback here, much like VTune, is that this is a um, this is a paid uh, program. So if you have access to it, it can be very useful because it can handle uh, a lot more data, and it's designed to handle MPI um, outputs and other uh, more complex code. Um, in this case, as it says, it can integrate over 100,000 MPI tasks. Um, so while it's not impossible to overwhelm DDT, it's much more equipped to handle uh, MPI codes or highly parallelized codes. Um, and it gives you more knobs and more options for selecting specific information or um, how much sampling you want to do. Uh, it can handle uh, tracking things like CUDA threads or um, any other subset of your code that you would like to uh, pinpoint. It also includes some very basic memory debugging tools, which is not necessarily common among debuggers. Um, as I mentioned before, Remora does some memory debugging, but um, it mostly will just indicate to you sort of where your, what the state of the memory is at various points in your code. Um, so that's another good way to sort of take a look um, at the various aspects of your code, not just the um, written content, but the way that it's performing on the node and where it might be interacting badly with the hardware. Um, so these are the links that I was talking about. Um, we have a tutorial available online about vectorization. Um, there's a uh, EECS from University of Michigan um, page that gives you a very short and sweet overview of GPROF. Um, but there's also the uh, docs uh, for GPROF straight from GNU, uh, same for GDB and DDD. GNU produces a lot of free software that's really reliable and gets used uh, pretty widely. Um, so it's a good option for um, sort of, um, if you're looking for resources, going, uh, going to GNU first is not a bad idea. We have a question. No? OK. Um, then I'm going to switch my display over to my terminal um, and live demo a couple of these uh, compilation examples. Um,
But if you have questions as we're going through these, please feel free to uh, jump in and I'll be happy to answer anything I can. Oh, I remember there was one earlier about um, the code vector C or vector dot C code. Someone's asking if it's available. I can make so it available. I'm guessing maybe the stuff that you demo, will that be available? Yes, it will be. So it'll be in that. Um, let's see. If, okay. uh, so yeah, I'm going to run through a couple of the examples that I mentioned in um, in the presentation, and I can make um, I can make those source files uh, available. I will um, get those posted. So um, all of these are demo. I'm demonstrating all of these on uh, the Stampede 2 system at TAC, uh, but these are all very simple um, C codes, and pretty much uh, pretty much everything I will be executing should be executable anywhere. Um, there'll be one variation possible with the uh, vectorization calculation, but I'll make note of that when I get to it. Um, Not my machine. All right. Um, okay. So I keep all of my training examples out here in my. Uh, Scratch directory. And first, I will demonstrate um, the vectorization code. So, here I've already compiled um, some of them from previous examples, but uh, we can take a look at the vector.c code. Um, and again, I'll make this uh, available. Uh, it was developed by one of my colleagues, um, who's a very nice person, so I didn't have to write my own example. Um, so this is code for vectorization of a a plus equals b times c. Um, so this particular kind of vectorization uh, has to do with uh, FAM. So um, basically, the order in which well, <coughs> excuse me, um, the order in which the system addresses the multiplication and addition um, can affect the uh, efficiency of the code. And that's what the vectorization flags will be doing uh, at compile time, is uh, determining which variation to use. So in this case, um, uh, function main uh, calculating for um, flops and the cycle um, of the run and then printing out the um, time used and the total of the calculation. Um, so starting the timer to track how long it takes, um, doing the actual calculation of the AC and matrix B, um, and then printing out that information at the end. Uh, so if we do uh, ICC, that's what I have. Yeah, until ICC. Uh, Uh, and then if we execute uh, Novak. Oh, yeah, sorry guys. I'm doing something that's very illegal. Please don't, please do not run on your login nodes. Um, this is how you get banned from the system. Uh, so, bad example. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to pick up a um, Skylake development node. Uh, okay. So now you can see from the header here that I'm on a Skylake node. Um, so this is a legal place to run, and I'm not going to get in trouble with my admin. Um, but now if I execute the Novak executable that we generated, uh, 
It'll take a while. Possibly even longer than expected. Now I'm wondering if I compiled this incorrectly. Try the one I need. Now we'll discover whether or not I'm just impatient or. <laughs> If I don't know what I'm doing. If you remember from the example slide, uh, the runtime for this was 46 seconds. Um, so depending on how touchy the node is feeling, it could be up to a minute at this point. There, 45.65 seconds gives us the correct sum. Uh, but that was a pretty painfully long time to wait for your code to run, right? Uh, so now I'm going to do uh, the opposite, which is compile vector C uh, for specifically for the SKX nodes that I'm on. So these particular flags would not work well on the KNL nodes, and I can demonstrate that again in just a second. Uh, so, but if I want to go the fastest I can possibly go on this specific style of node, then I'm going to use export dash AVX 512 and set the ZMMM register usage uh, um, to high. Less than two seconds. So you can see, like in real time, exactly how painful it is to run something that is unoptimized for the hardware that you're on. And you can imagine how much worse that would be if the code was more than just a handful of lines long. Um, so if I use the same um, executable on a KNL node. So if I run the Novak, this should, again, take about the same amount of time, almost a minute. Um, because again, we put no special features on this code. So it'll still run. It won't have um, much of an impact um, changing the node. The architecture won't matter. Demoing bad code is always so incredibly painful. <laughs> it just takes so long. It just takes longer too. This is on the mm -hmm. Yeah. Hardware matters, and this is, this is why.
So part of the reason this is slower on the KNL nodes is that the uh, KNL nodes themselves have a lower clock speed. Um, so frequently, if you run something that's designed for an SKX node and then attempt to run it on a KNL node, it'll take two to three times as long. And it's because you didn't program for the specific architecture. And in this case, the KNL nodes just naturally have a lower clock speed, so that's something to keep in mind. Though at this point, we may just have to give up on it because it's so bad. It's already been twice as long as it was on the other one. But one of the main things I wanted to show you was the um, error you're going to get if you attempt to use something that was compiled for a specific system that was not this one. You'll see an error like this with, uh, please verify that both the operating system and the processor support ABX 512 set instructions. Um, so the specific flags that were used, that we used earlier to compile this ABX 512 SKX VMM file, um, don't mesh with the information that is, or with the um, architecture that is available on the KNL nodes. And so the system will immediately dump it out because it doesn't recognize the flags that it was compiled with. If I use one of these other uh, pre-compiled codes, um, so in this case, if I run the common version, um, it'll still complete on the SKX nodes, and it's still infinitely faster than the no vectorization on the KNI nodes, which never completed. This version only took five seconds. Um, but the change that you're seeing here is a direct result of um, the difference in the architecture between the KNI nodes and the SKX nodes. Um, so always keep in mind the kind of architecture you're running um, and accommodate that as you uh, build and compile your code. I'm going to switch back to the FKX nodes for the other demonstration for the sake of everybody's sanity. So if I come in here and we take a look at the hello.c code, um, this is the same as you saw on uh, slide 21 in slide deck. Um, again, function main, function foo, uh, one prints main, one prints foo, and changes a uh, integer. So um, here I've already compiled uh, hello as well as a not a number code. Um, and so if I do GDB hello, um, starts up, no problem, has read all the input, um, then I can run that code and um, shows inside main and inside foo. It's also giving me some extra information here. I don't currently have uh, glibc um, enabled in my uh, profile, um, but it's not uh, actually impacting the code. This is just a message from GDB telling me about the state of my um, debugging process uh, and why it may not be as effective as it could be. So now if I put a breakpoint in at main, so that's my breakpoint on line six. Now if I run, it runs up until the breakpoint one um, at main, and it shows me what's on line six. And line six is printf inside main. Uh, so now if I want to keep going through the rest of the code, I'm going to type continue. Uh, and now it will uh, run through until it completes all of its tasks. So it will finally print out main, whereas previously where I had the breakpoint was on the print line. So it didn't run the print line. So when I continue, it runs the inside main print and runs the inside foo print. And then I get the same 
she lives here. <coughs> um, I can't remember. Yeah, no sack. Um, so anyway, that's sort of like the basic interaction with GDP and what that looks like um, in real time. That like it is interactive, and that you would be giving individual commands um, as the system uh, runs through. Quit GDP for a second. Come back out here. So here, I've also um, created a little Lana number. Uh, executable, and I can make this one available too. This is a very, uh, very, very small code. One example of divide by zero, and one example of calculating an imaginary number. <laughs> so, same process, GDB, dot slash my number. So here you can see um, that the two instances of printing out um, both come, uh, one specifically with a not a number error, uh, one with um, an unrecognized uh, integer error. So again, uh, this is a good way to sort of see what's happening. And so if I go back, um, I can't remember what the function means are because I was not paying attention. Um, so yeah, this is the first break at so All right. So there you can see that the error sets out because I don't have functions in this particular code. Um, it's just a straightforward math calculation. So setting breakpoints gets a little more, um, since it's not finding a specific function, you have to be uh, more specific about how to set it. Um, but, you get the general idea of like this is sort of how you use GDB interactively and how to uh, sort of work with the um, data that you have. Um, I'm trying to think of any other good examples. <coughs> I can make this one available too. This is actually from a different. Um, I had this one cheap rock example um, for um, compiling uh, things for GPROC. So again, like using the um, ICC flags, et cetera. Um, so if we compile GPROC C, Oh, because I didn't compile with the correct flag. Sorry, these are a set of examples I didn't prepare. I can give better instructions when I post these. I forgot I had these in my folder. Um, but um, basically, GPROF testing and GDB testing and your outputs um, work similarly. And Mostly, you're just going to want to play around with your code as you work on it. Um, there's a lot of, you know, every code is individual. You're going to have to um, make changes. But as long as you document all of the things that you're doing, you're probably going to have a pretty pretty good chance of reproducing any errors and also fixing any of the issues that you encounter. Um, any questions popped up? Uh, one person asks, can you debug remotely from Windows using Visual Studio or VC or VC? Yeah, so you can do it that way if you prefer to debug. So debugging with something like uh, Visual Studio um, will help you debug the actual um, code formatting that you have available to you. 
Um, so yeah, if you want to take like if you want to take your C file out and put it into Visual Studio, Visual Studio and debug that way, you can. However, um, that's not going to help you catch things like memory problems, um, and it also may not help you catch um, certain performance errors just because running it um, on that machine won't um, won't replicate the full system, right? So if you're running with specific architecture flags, um, you might not get the same results. So generally speaking, I would recommend that you debug on the system you're attempting to run on. Um, but if you're just debugging sort of the basic uh, code structure of what you've written, then running in Visual Studio is fine. And that's why the only question during okay. the demo time that some people are typing now. So okay. I'll finish typing on this. And like I said, I'll, I'll bundle these examples up um, with instructions uh, for posting. Um, I forgot that I had profiling ones available in here. It's been a while since I did that tutorial. So. Um, and yeah, any questions via Slack, or you can email us here at TAC, um, or just ask in general um, for the Slack or for Blue Waters. Um, each um, each uh, site, each institution, each machine is going to have its own um, quirks. And so if you're not sure which flags to use, always check the user guides for the sites, and uh, you can then always contact uh, the help desk for the various machines as well. So, it should be a little less time than I expected. Um, but if there's not anything else. Uh, there's just one thing about what's on the screen right now. Yeah. It says, regarding the demo on the screen, to generate gmon.out, the programmer must run dot slash gprop underscore test and then gprop space dot slash gprop test. Yeah. yeah that's what yes, I mean. that was There's more of a common question. That is correct. Um, yeah. I, again, I apologize for not pre preparing that one. I completely missed it. Um, so, okay. Well, you yeah. just spare 10 minutes, I guess. Um, so, yeah. Thanks for your time. And like I said, just let us know if you come up with questions later in the middle of the night. Um, feel free to send them in and we'll get to you as soon as we can. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Virginia. That was great. You got some nice compliments on the Slack channel.